Okay, well, good morning and welcome everybody to July's Business Before Hours. I know it's raining outside, but um, I guess on the bright side of virtual networking, uh, we all are already in our spots and, and uh, don't have to worry about the rain, at least for the time being. Uh, before we get into our program today, I want to uh, just make you aware of a few calendar things and upcoming events and opportunities that, that you probably uh, want to avail yourselves of. Uh, first off, next week on Thursday, so week tomorrow, August the 6th, we have two great events that you are going to want to be part of. First is a lunch and learn. And it, the title of that, which I think is just, it's fascinating. It's making the pivot online retail and operations in the new normal. So uh, look for a uh, registration link for that in tomorrow's e-minder. Uh, what we found in the last uh, four months is that many of our businesses, even in light of uh, the emergence of online sales in the last decade, really weren't ready to pivot as quickly as they needed to during the coronavirus. And so this is a timely topic and I think one that we will all benefit from. Uh, it will be virtual. So uh, you'll be able to log in and thanks to our, our sponsors, uh, there's no fee for that. You will just need to uh, pack your own lunch that day and, uh, and join in the conversation. Also, uh, that afternoon on Thursday the 6th at 4 is going to be our uh, Thursday after hours. Many of you will recognize that we've kind of uh, pivoted our time a little bit for uh, for our, some of our network after hour ne networking events from four to five. And so uh, you'll definitely want to uh, make sure you sign up and get the link for that one. It will be virtual again. It's hosted by Crit and Brink Architecture and uh, we're going to be hosting our local school superintendent, Dr. Nick, He's going to be talking to us about the upcoming school year. Uh, no doubt we won't have enough time to answer all of everybody's questions, but uh, hopefully within the hour, uh, we'll be able to get through a lot of uh, questions and, and things that, that are on everybody's minds as parents, family members, and just community citizens who are curious about what uh, the school year is going to look like here in just a few weeks. Next uh, on the agenda, on my uh, calendar agenda is uh, Leadership Norman applications are available and they are due early next month. So if you are interested in applying for Leadership Norman, we would love for you to do that. I know there are um, multiple graduates on the call this morning and uh, we have every intention on going forward with our program as normal. Now, if we had to make a little change here or there, we will do that, but it is our intent to have a robust leadership program this fall and early spring. The Aviation Transportation Committee is going to be meeting in August and uh, excited for that program. Uh, look for more information about it, but uh, we're gonna have somebody from the Department of Public Safety come and talk about the real ID. So you'll be able to uh, participate in that virtually. And then lastly, um, two things all related to an August 25th election. One is that voter registration deadline is this Friday, July the 31st. If you are not registered to vote uh, yet, you need to do that. And if you, are, if you um, get registered before the 31st or by the 31st, you'll be eligible to vote on August the 25th. As all of you know, particularly um, our friends of the library that are on the call, uh, five years plus now ago, uh, the citizens of Norman adopted a very significant quality of life initiative called Norman Forward. And because of that, um, we are able to enjoy our two world-class libraries, Westwood Aquatic Center, Westwood Tennis Park, and there, a uh, part of that initiative was uh, other very significant projects uh, that we all want to see done to the same quality as our libraries and other, uh, other items that I just mentioned. And so we have an opportunity on the 25th to vote to ensure 
uh, that we complete those projects as originally designed. And there will also be three other items on the ballot that day, a municipal complex package, uh, and then a item dealing with homelessness and another item dealing with economic recovery for small businesses. Uh, there'll be a lot more information coming out on all four of those in the coming weeks. I realize we're now less than a month away from that election. Um, so stay tuned, but for right now, just make sure you're registered to vote. Um, and if not, July the 31st is your deadline. Okay, so let's uh, get into our program. Uh, first, I, I can't say thank you enough to Pioneer Library System for hosting uh, this morning's event. Uh, we had all had big, big um, expectations and goals to be able to do this. Uh, for me, just down the street at the New Central Library, that was our hope. I know, Caroline, that was your hope to be able to host all of us. And, and we will do that, I know, in the future and make that happen. Um, but like everybody else, we needed to, uh, to just kind of uh, come up with a plan B. And, and so thankfully, technology has allowed that to happen. But, um, but I think because of that, we have the opportunity to, um, to really dig deep into, into different topics and issues on these uh, networking calls that we've been hosting for the last few months. And I think it's provided a great education opportunity for so many of us. And so I'm, I'm excited about our speakers this morning because I know I'm going to learn something and uh, thrilled that all of you have uh, taken the time uh, to join us today. As, as we learn a little bit more about um, our local library system, but also uh, state libraries. And I can tell you having uh, been involved in, in a little bit of the, the state library system, uh, it's vast, it's more than what we imagine. Um, and uh, there's so much opportunity out there and ways that our library system all across the state of Oklahoma is impacting each of us that we probably don't even realize. So with that, uh, let me first introduce uh, our first speaker, Lisa Wells. Now, most of you on the call, and let me say this, I think we may have some folks who are on the call who might be participating uh, in the library conference today. And so uh, welcome to all of those guests. I, I, hope that, uh, I hope that each of you that, are, that happen to be participating through that uh, function. We'll um, come to Norman at a later date and, uh, and join us in some, some, some of our different functions. So Lisa, uh, Lisa is the Executive Director of Pioneer Library System in Central Oklahoma. She's a graduate of OU with an MLIS in Library and Information Studies, a graduate of the Urban Libraries Council, Executive Leadership Institute, recipient of the ULC Joey Rogers Leadership Award, the 2008 Library Journal Mover and Shaker and a graduate of Leadership Oklahoma. Lisa, thank you so much. Um, I, I can't say enough uh, good things about you, uh, your entire team, the leadership that you provide for our community. Uh, I know you have a lot more to worry about than just Norman, but, but we feel uh, very blessed that you are ours. And so thank you so much. And I'm gonna kick it to you uh, to, Kick things off this morning. And let me make sure we are we need to unmute you. There you go. I was uh, just saying, uh, giving some thanks, Scott. It's always a pleasure to be involved with the chamber. And uh, we also feel very lucky that our headquarters are here in Norman and we get to be a part of um, the community and the things that are going on, not only in Norman, but in nine other communities, but Norman is our only location where we actually have multiple locations. And so just want to acknowledge that. And you spoke briefly about Norman Forward and three great libraries, two of which are brand new and, and were built as a part of that quality of life package. And I am sure that I'm partial, but they are just beautiful facilities. And um, with the great staff that we have at Pioneer, I think they're just an asset to the community. And Scott, I know that um, you're a supporter and even during your time at the Capitol, you were known as a library supporter. And so when we found out that you were going to be uh, the CEO of the chamber, we felt 
we felt very lucky and we felt that we could be an active partner. And I think that's what libraries all across Oklahoma try to do is to be active partners in their communities or their counties or whatever their jurisdiction is. Um, at Pioneer, we have just over 300 employees. About half of those are full-time employees, salaried staff, and the other half are hourly staff. Um, our libraries are open anywhere from 62 to 75 hours a week. So all of our locations are open seven days a week. And as many of the leaders in Pioneer are on a lot of calls now, frankly, like we all are uh, with peers and partners across the United States and regionally, um, Pioneer gets to realize how truly blessed we are. Uh, we're blessed for a number of reasons. One, because we are funded by ad valorem tax and that's a very stable funding mechanism. A lot of our friends in big urban areas are funded by um, sales tax. And um, a lot of you all on the, on the call this morning will understand the ebb and flow of sales tax. And you might have some appreciation for, in the course of the, the city's budget, how important or not important the library may be. You know, when you are up against public safety and you're the library, oftentimes the library looks like an easy thing to save some dollars on. And so uh, Pioneer is very blessed that we are a part of a system that we're funded by ad valorem and that our citizens have voted to tax themselves for library service. That originally happened in 1958 so uh, Pioneer became a system in 1958, and the initial uh, director was the Norman librarian at the time, Mr. Bill Lowry. And so over those years, we've only had four directors. I am the fourth director, had big shoes to fill, um, and I've enjoyed trying to do so. But I believe that part of the reason why Pioneer continues to be an innovator kind of in the library world is that Pioneer is our name and we are governed by a board of trustees and very, they very much respect um, and appreciate Pioneer being on the, on the front edge of everything that's going on. And I, in my um, director's report last night at the board meeting, I said we used to call it the bleeding edge. And so since March, we've been calling it the COVID edge because as, as Scott said, everybody is pivoting. Everything that we knew on March the 13th when we closed our libraries is not a day that we will know for many, many months and maybe even years to come. Um, it, it service will not look like that and immediately, um, even when the numbers start to go down again. So uh, just wanna say that we appreciate the community support. We take very seriously uh, being an active, engaged member in our community and in our chambers. Uh, our biggest investment as a library system is personnel. We spend about 68% of our total budget on personnel. And I personally meet every full-time candidate that's moved forward because my philosophy is it doesn't really matter how many, uh, what our portfolio of resources look like if we don't have the right people delivering those resources. And people um, are our biggest investment. And so we wanna make sure we have the right person um, in the right seat on the bus and that everybody is coming forward with a servant's heart and, and has um, customer service at the, at the top of their priority. And we're looking for people who like people. Uh, we do a lot of interviews and we hear a lot of people who say they love to read and, and we like that and we think that's a virtue that's, that's worthy of mentioning, but rather um, in, in addition to liking literature or loving to read, we really need our employees to love people because we're in the people business. So Scott, thank you for um, allowing me to say a little bit about Pioneer and, and later on, if you want me to talk about Oklahoma libraries, I'm happy to do that as well. Great, thank you, Lisa, very much. Next, our next speaker is Melody Kellogg. Melody is Oklahoma's fifth state librarian. Boy, you guys are like, I seem, it feels like it, between the two of you, libraries in its infancy, which is not the case, but fourth and fifth, here we go. She's the fifth uh, state librarian and state arch archivist 
since the Oklahoma Department of Libraries was created in 1967. Kellogg's experience includes community and economic development on the state and local levels, city and nonprofit management, and library service in large and small settings. After working 13 years in community and downtown revitalization with the Oklahoma Department of Commerce's Main Street program, she followed a similar path with 11 years in municipal government where her responsibilities included organizational development, grant writing, historic preservation, and project coordination at City Hall and the library. After two years working in ministry, she rejoined the library ranks by managing one of the state's busiest public libraries. In 2015, she was asked to provide oversight for multiple urban libraries and system-wide departments and launch a new centralized call center. Kellogg holds bachelor's, bachelor and master's degrees in business administration from UCO and a master of library and information services from OU. Melody, welcome to the Norman Chamber of Commerce Business Before Hours. Thank you so much for making time for us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I, I like what you said, Scott, about us being just the fourth and the fifth because I come from city management where you're the fourth in four years <laughs> or from chamber director uh, positions also. Sometimes there are locations where those uh, turn over quite frequently. So this is not that kind of a job. Um, so today my job is to talk about what is happening with libraries, uh, mostly from the state and from the national level, just from the perspective of the state library. And it seems like a really good place to start would be to give just a brief overview of what the Department of Libraries is, who we are, and what we do. And so I think I get to share my screen here for just a couple of seconds. Is that right? Yes, you should have the right. permission to do that. Let's see here. Okay, are you seeing a slide now? Yes. Okay, very good. So the Oklahoma Department of Libraries, as you said in the too long bio, I'll have to work on that, mm -hmm. is uh, that the Oklahoma Department of Libraries has existed as a state agency since 1967. The state library has been, uh, is much, much older than that, but in, for the purposes of just a brief overview, we serve as the official state library, the official state archives, um, we have the Archives and Records Commission that uh, I sit on as the state librarian and state archivist and then representatives from the governor's office, lieutenant governor's office, treasurer's office, etc. cetera, uh, form a commission and that, that body oversees the records, state records administration process, retention schedules, disposition schedules. And then probably what we're most well known for is the library development piece. And this includes uh, literacy programming, but we work with public libraries and we do have some special libraries right now that would comprise uh, institutional libraries, which are libraries in the 14 or in 14 correctional institutions in Oklahoma. And then we also serve as the State Library Administrative Agency or the SLAA. And that's kind of a mouthful, but what it means is that uh, the Institute of Library, uh, sorry, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which is the primary source of federal support for the nation's libraries and museums, uh, their funding supports most of what we do in library development and in literacy and some other things as well, some efficiencies in the statewide management of uh, resources that are available to every Oklahoman. But this SLAA, um, the funding we get through that process, basically funds most of what we do in library development. Uh, the next thing I want to show you, and this is it, this is, these are all the slides I have, are a, this is a map of Oklahoma, I'm sure you recognize that. Lisa mentioned the fact that Pioneer Library System, which is this sort of um, dark orange here, uh, three counties, that they have, uh, they're funded with ad valorem. These other areas that are also the counties that are colored are the other uh, library systems. We have eight in Oklahoma. And all of those are funded with primarily with ad valorem taxes. All of these other libraries from Boise City out here in Cimarron County to Antlers, which if you can see, it's almost surrounded by the gold here um, down in Pushmataha County. Those are what we call independent or municipal libraries. And there are roughly half 
roughly half of our library locations are part of a system and roughly half are part of a unit or are a municipal or independent library and those independent libraries are basically uh, a city department so just like you would have the public works department or the police department or the library department i mean the fire department you would have a library department and so there is at least one public library in every county um, but you can see that roughly half of those are funded with that um, fickle, I'll call it, <laughs> sales tax. And so yes, uh, Pioneer Library System is blessed to have such stable funding because as you know, when the um, things started turning uh, with the shelter in place, et cetera, cities immediately had to start not only responding but preparing for a long-term decline in sales tax and every department is impacted by that. So. Um, Anyway, that's a brief overview of what uh, the Department of Libraries does. Libraries across the state and across the country have basically done something that resembles what businesses did, which is number one, they closed, right? Everybody had to close, had to stay home, had to shelter in place. We had some essential businesses. Um, then we shifted as quickly as we could or pivoted. I love what you said about um, making the pivot to online retail, I think it was. Uh, we shifted quickly from providing services in person to doing so via technology. And some of that was relatively easy. Librarians have long answered a phone and answered reference and research questions. So people call in or even renewed materials or put something on hold that they wanted to pick up later. So that part was relatively easy once they were able to, you know, get the technology in place or they could answer the phones or be in the building. But then we started seeing them hosting online story times, uh, adding virtual classes, exhibits even, discussion groups. Some are addressing career development needs for those who have been laid off. And then we started offering, just like the restaurants did and others, uh, curbside service. My husband and I recently signed some papers at the attorney's office and we signed them in our car outside uh, in the parking lot and the attorney came to us and handed the papers to us through the window. So curbside service has become very common with uh, libraries and businesses alike. Then we saw a combination of curbside with limited uh, in-person visits so some people some people could come in the building for certain things and then we've been opening seeing uh, libraries open with social distancing and safety precautions in place while responding daily to changing conditions again it just mirrors what we've been seeing in society in some cases that meant that they had to return to curbside service or even close the doors again for a deep clean or remove furniture um, from you know libraries spent a lot of time and money uh, trying to make their spaces welcoming and safe and ready for people to congregate and gather. And then this turned, and so we had to start pulling that away and separating things. So it's, that's been a, an interesting uh, shift that we've seen. But libraries continue to look for ways to fill their community's greatest gaps as a result of the uh, pandemic or even despite the pandemic. We see food distribution to families and some of our smallest libraries in Oklahoma and some of them are pretty tiny. They still do remarkable work. Telemedicine appointments are being held at the library. Libraries that didn't already provide 24 seven Wi-Fi started leaving it on after uh, hours for use from, by customers from their cars. Pioneer probably was already doing that and, and had long seen the after hours usage of their Wi-Fi and could count it and track it and everything, but not every library was in that position to do so. And Lisa didn't mention it, but I will. They used their 3D printers to print face shields and related items for health workers. And you saw that happening at Pioneer and at other places. The results have been, um, We've seen some good things. Um, we've also seen some uh, things that we hope won't have lasting uh, negative impacts, but they may. Uh, for example, two, we talked about municipal libraries and how they're funded with sales tax. Two municipal libraries I know were directed to lay off their entire staff. So for weeks, it was the library director running those libraries, and they weren't small libraries. I would call them mid-sized, and they were running them all by themselves from the from inside the building, trying to hold on to everything. Um, 
Some are considering or have started implementing furloughs. We talked about it at the agency. Um, thankfully, we do not think that will be necessary if we are able to sustain the budget with only a 4% cut this year. Others lost staff who either couldn't or wouldn't work back in a public setting for whatever reasons they had. And the library may or may not be able to refill those positions. But the biggest impact, and I liked what Lisa said about we want people who like people. Um, and I agree with her wholeheartedly, but the impact that we've seen most has been on our customers. We closed. Libraries closed nationally. And every year there are over a billion visits to public libraries every year. So think about that impact. We just heard yesterday uh, in a meeting that, that Lisa was holding that compare that to Disneyland, they get 18 million. And we get about 1.3 billion in public libraries. Um, so there was no place for many people to turn to for homework help, the community's meeting space, the office space for teleworking. Not everybody can do so from home. Um, having someone to help with that internet use, just having a device and having access to the internet isn't always enough. Sometimes they need that person and that's what libraries do. We fill those gaps. We find people who need help. They need help accessing, you know, service of some type or they want information of some type and we have the resources and the ability. We may not know the answer, but we certainly know how to hunt it down and that's what that's what we do. Um, just yesterday, a customer of our agency wrote saying these are trying times for everybody but it is valuable to have paper libraries. That's what he called them, paper libraries, even if in a restricted way. And he was speaking that we have moved to serving patrons to um, an appointment only basis. Libraries services are extremely wide ranging and generally in high demand. And I, I want, just wanna mention two impacts that I'm convinced um, are the result of having to close libraries. You can argue with me later if you want, this is my, very strong opinion. I'm convinced that OESC would not have had to rent space at the Reed Center and in Tulsa to, to provide um, the service to all those people who are standing in line day after day if our public libraries had been able to be fully operational. I think those people would have been seen in the libraries instead getting that help, getting that one-on-one -on -one assistance. Another impact is the census. The U.S. Census Bureau recognized very early on that the hardest to count areas in the country were located very near a public library. And so they reached out very early and said, we need your help getting an accurate census count. Well, then right as we're getting ready to count, what happened? We had to close the libraries. I think we're seeing the results of that now. Um, I'm going to skip on from some other things, but it's also, as Lisa said, no day looks like it did before. You know, when you, we started uh, seeing libraries offer story time online, the question arose, are there, and if so, what are the copyright implications? Especially if you're going to record this uh, presentation and then you're going to play it later. Um, if a library were to expand its internet access beyond library property, Will they jeopardize the federal fund, federal discounts that they get through E-rate and the state discounts that they get? What is the um, uh, what is the uh, implication with the CIPA or the Children's Internet Protection Act if you are expanding beyond? All kinds of things that we had never had to worry about that came into play because of having to uh, because of responding. I want to speak real briefly, um, if I can, to the national, a uh, couple of national things. So obviously the government responded with stimulus payments, grant opportunities, et cetera. And the CARES Act, if you're not aware, did include some money for museums and libraries. In fact, it, there was $50 million, which sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money. But by the time you distribute it out to all of the libraries and museums, um, we were able to give up to $1,000 grants to 64 libraries in Oklahoma for um, personal protective equipment and supplies. And then we set aside another 300,000 that we're doing digital inclusion grants. And we based that on a survey of our libraries and uh, museums and talking to some of our partners and folks out in the field. But that is to um, provide additional access to digital educational content, computing devices and broadband connections. Uh, in early July, or earlier this month, Senator uh, Reed of Rhode Island and Representative Levin of Michigan, um, with the support of 45 other legislators, introduced the Library Stabilization Fund Act. And he and his colleagues wrote, 
the library cuts that are anticipated will ripple throughout our communities, affecting support for education, workforce recovery, and access to computers and internet. He said libraries are leveraging their physical spaces to host local emergency planning meetings, serve as distribution points for food, medical supplies, student laptops, books, and hotspots. And then he finished with libraries like other public and private institutions are keeping up with this community demand for information resources while also experiencing, experiencing lost revenue that will only deepen as this health and economic crisis continues. And it is fairly traditional, I shouldn't say fairly, it is, it is historically true that just when uh, the economy starts to turn down is when libraries, the demand for library services increases. So we are seeing uh, an imbalance in what we need to be able to support our communities. In addition to the CARES Act, there are also efforts advocating that libraries be included in any subsequent funding provided by the federal government. But it's not just about the federal government, and I want to make that clear. Private sector also immediately responded in a remarkable way. Um, vendors reached out. Uh, EBSCO, one that we use for statewide uh, online resources, check it out if you're not familiar. Anybody at Pioneer can help you with that. Um, Britannica offered free uh, resources to social studies and science topics and then movies and books. Um, the online computer library center made top scientific and medical journals and books and movies free for uh, libraries, most of them for about 90 days, some until the pandemic ended. I think they'll probably revisit that part. We've had a grant uh, offered to us from uh, Google to provide job seeker and small business grow with Google events uh, in the state. We have until tomorrow to decide if we have the capacity to handle it because the, so we've been overwhelmed and inundated beautifully with so many opportunities that responding to all of them has taxed our capacity. And then one last thing I want to share is um, something that in two nonprofit organizations and the IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Services that I mentioned earlier, uh, they responded by doing a study on how long the virus that causes COVID-19 survives on certain surfaces. This was another issue. How long, when someone, if someone brings it back and we don't know if it's safe to recirculate, how long do we need to hold on to it after we've, you know, cleaned it or just held it in quarantine? What do we do with this thing? So they have, they developed a research project uh, called Reopening Archives, Libraries, and Museums, or Realm. And the purpose was to create and distribute science-based information designed to reduce the risk of transmission of COVID-19 to staff and visitors uh, who were engaging in library, museum, and archive services. They have so far tested of library materials. Those commonly handled are hardback book covers, softback book covers, plain paper pages inside a closed book, magazine pages, glossy, uh, like uh, covers from a, or glossy pages from like a coffee table book, children's board books. So we're very appreciative that they did this because many libraries were holding their materials up to two weeks thinking this isn't safe, we need to quarantine them. And now we've learned that the standard really is about 96 hours which means we can make materials available to the customers much earlier. So I just want to say in closing that we've learned, as if we didn't already know, that library, the library community is very resilient. Um, we already knew the needs across this country are great, but what's wonderful is that public libraries respond to community needs, even when they're forced to close their doors. And I'm proud to be a part of the library community in Oklahoma. So thank you for letting me speak this morning and uh, appreciate the opportunity. Okay, thank you, Melody. Well, I've got a request and then a question for you. Uh, first off, the request. Okay. Your, your map of, of the uh, state of Oklahoma, Oklahoma libraries, you got to make Pioneer Library. I know. Other than I can't believe you noticed that. <laughs> we got So the orange or the, or the fact that it only has nine libraries still listed. Yeah. Give us a, oh. a oh. nice red or crimson, you know, so. So okay. I didn't design it, but I would have put it in orange if I had, just so you know. <laughs> what did you say, Lisa? I said, it, go ahead and update both of those things. Yeah, okay, well, I'll work on that. So uh, my, my first question is, is uh, related to your last comment about sanitation and how long the virus lasts. I was at a local bowling alley recently and they've bought 
some special equipment to sanitize the bowling balls after you know each person utilizes them and things and, and you mentioned 96 hours uh, that the virus could potentially be on a book. Are libraries taking any extra steps or anything um, in, in, you know, in that intervening time when they get books back? What Absolutely. Books, Absolutely. Uh, Lisa, you want to speak what Pioneer is doing? Because that's probably what he cares most about, but yes, they are. Sure, Melody. Um, Scott, we actually started out quarantining um, even when we opened, quarantining materials for 72 hours because that was what was uh, most thought was the safe precaution. Uh, the realm study did show that there's a minimal trace on some materials, mostly newspapers and magazines at 96 hours. Most of the public libraries are staying at 72 hours or doing something that we did, which was we just are not making newspapers and magazines available. Um, those are things that people don't really check out and take home. They use them in the library. And right now our in-library use is really only for public computers. But as you can imagine, it's important to clean those as well. So we have looked at a number of different solutions that we've piloted throughout the system, one of which is a um, UV light wand. So all of the branches are using a UV light wand to clean keyboards and, and mice. Uh, we very quickly uh, transition to microbial keyboards and mice to also help with those um, challenges that you see. Uh, we have not yet gone for the Ziploc baggie over the keypad, which I know is also an option. Uh, we haven't been that direction yet, but our staff are doing their due diligence about cleaning tables and hard surface equipment after each use. And we've got a lot of signage up that says for things like our 24 hour libraries and our movie boxes, that as a customer, you have some personal responsibility for your safety and your health. And so we want folks to know that it's beyond our capacity to clean those machines, especially those that are not at one of our actual bricks and mortar locations after each use. So for us, it's, a, it's kind of a um, partnership in cleaning and cleansing and sanitation, both with staff and the, the facilities, as well as with our customers. Very good. And Lisa, uh, as far as Pioneer goes, what's the, what's the time frame and, and plan moving forward, um, you know, for, for each, of our, each of our local libraries? One of the things that was important to us, Scott, in the very beginning was to do everything as a system so that we weren't in a situation where one community was open more so than another community or somebody had more restrictions than another community. So we made all of our decisions um, as a system and we were closed for 64 days with staff at home teleworking. Uh, providing digital programming and doing a lot of cleanup of our databases, answering phones remotely, and also providing our text chat help um, seven days a week. When we opened back up, we opened up with limited services, which is where we still are now. Um, we were anticipating a shift to the next phase uh, two weeks ago, right about the time the numbers spiked again. And so we are still in a holding pattern. And, um, you know, when you think about that capacity, limiting capacity, and, and you take, for example, the new Central Library, 50% 50, 50 capacity of the new Central Library is 600 people. And it is not the time to convene 600 people in one building. So we're trying to find the balance between uh, being available to the community and keeping staff safe and being part of the solution um, around large crowds rather than part of the problem. Very good. So I'm going to keep asking some questions, but if anybody else has anything they want to ask or make any comments, certainly uh, feel free to either raise your virtual hand uh, or real hand and or type something in the chat and we'll do our best to, to uh, relay that information. Melody, on the, on the state level, I, 
I assume the Department of Libraries is still underneath the uh, education umbrella of appropriations and in the legislature. <laughs> and which I, which by the way, I think um, says a lot, right? I mean, we, we um, I don't know what the general thought is on libraries, but it's a critical cog in the overall wheel of education. And so, uh, what's do you, do you have any prognosis or outlook uh, for the coming session and in the future of funding uh, for libraries? <laughs> well, first of all, yes, we are uh, still under education. Uh, Governor Stitt combined education with Secretary of State, so Secretary Rogers is uh, the Cabinet Secretary. ODL is a, an independent agency, so the governor appoints seven members to a governing board, and then they hire the director, and then um, we have a, I used to call it the incredible shrinking agency, but I decided that everybody could probably lay claim to that. Uh, we have a staff of about 34 now. Um, I understand about uh, 12 years ago, it was 82, so it's it has, um, it was a difficult period, but obviously, you know, if the funding's not there, the funding's not there. Um, so in terms of looking forward to what I think the funding picture is for libraries, um, so if you're, if you're part of a system, I think that your funding, as, as it always is, is going to be more stable just because you don't see Edelorm tax doesn't tend to have the volatility that sales tax does. I'm very concerned about our municipal libraries because, um, and, and one of the things that uh, we did, I'm sorry, let me finish that, that statement before I move on. I'm very concerned about municipal libraries just because of the fact that we have seen uh, so much uh, volatility in the sales tax collections. And I think that that will continue to be. So I hope a lot of people attend <laughs> your session and not just from Norman so that they can um, pivot, if you will, and make those, the changes that they need to, to have a strong business community because we definitely need a strong business community. Uh, like Lisa said, it's, it's a partnership. Um, one of the things that we did do is uh, we have had a, um, a state aid grant for public libraries for many, many years. That, that fund has also declined over years. And so um, it's not really as much of an incentive as it used to be for public libraries, although I think some do still really rely on it. I know when I was in a small library that that was the difference between uh, buying a world book encyclopedia that year, and this was before <laughs> it was available online through the state. Um, so we did have some emergency rules put in place so that we can continue to provide those state aid grants to public libraries this coming year, despite the fact that so many had to close. And the reason I'm mentioning that is that um, number of hours of service is one of those criteria for eligibility for, this, for these grants. And it's based on um, population served and the geographic area served. And, um, and a number of other factors, things, things that the libraries have to do in order to qualify. One of them is they're, it's tiered. So if you're of a certain size community, you're required to have a library uh, director who has a master's in library science. If you are um, a certain size community, you might be required to have a certain number of hours after five and on the weekends. And again, it, the point is, the purpose is to ensure that, that Oklahomans have access to quality libraries and library services. And so a lot of what we do is provide resources, continuing education for library employees, we help them with the, the assistance for applying for E-rate to make sure that they qualify for the maximum uh, discounts for internet access and um, uh, equipment. And a variety of other things we even, we do conference uh, grants to make sure that library workers are getting access to that professional development. And so those are some of the things that, that we do. And then we have certain criteria that we want them to meet in order to qualify for those grants. So, um, this year, the state aid uh, pool of funds uh, was decreased, I want to say by 8%, because we've, we've cut everything else, all that's left pretty much, the only big pots of money we have left are 
the, the money that goes to the libraries and to the literacy councils. So it, it puts us in a really bad spot. We, like I said, I, I explained how we've shrunk. So uh, we've obviously been letting uh, the positions uh, sit vacant and trying to still meet our statutory requirements. And it's a challenge. Yeah. Does that answer your question? It does, it does, definitely. And, and um, as a little um, teaser, I guess, um, the, the first session conference this morning that I get to speak at, we're going to talk briefly about advocacy. So we'll talk uh, a little bit about how we can uh, best support funding for libraries uh, during that. Appreciate that. Um, a few years ago, I was so blessed to be able to attend the Urban Libraries Conference in Philadelphia with Caroline. And it was an incredible experience uh, to come together with um, with systems all across the country and learn best practices and see what's going on. But it's really inspired by what uh, particularly Philadelphia has done, partnering with the business community. Um, and so I'm curious, either either of you or anybody else that's on the call, to share maybe a little bit about uh, what libraries can do to benefit our local business community and how we can partner together uh, to best serve businesses, customers, and just overall entrepreneurship. Scott, let me say just a couple of things about um, workforce development. And then I'm going to kick it to Caroline because, as you know, the Norman Libraries do a lot to partner with our business community as well as uh, all of our branches in Pioneer. But an exciting thing that's happening, Scott, that is coming up on Monday, it, the American Library Association president, Julius Jefferson, is hosting a, a tour basically from the East Coast to the West Coast. And originally, months ago, it's going to be a bus tour and he was going to, you know, take a bus and make all these stops. And we were excited. And then he quickly had to pivot to a virtual tour. But he's now making 11 stops on the virtual bus tour. And Oklahoma was selected as one of those stops and Pioneer Library System and Oklahoma Library Association are co-hosting. And the topic of Monday's stop is career and workforce development. And ALA saw Oklahoma um, as a really great example of some of the things that we're doing, partnering with COWIB, the, the uh, Central Oklahoma Workforce Inv Innovation Board, um, the work that we're doing with the Cleveland County Sheriff's Office and the Reset Pod, our career online high school program that we do at Pioneer along with the job fairs and the career fairs and the services that are specifically de designed for um, veterans. And then the work that we piloted last year with more public schools on the career a development internship program. So we're going to talk about those things in a panel discussion on Monday. Congressman Cole is actually going to be on the discussion. He's going to be highlighting kind of national trends and workforce development and things that are going on. And then we, we have a teaser question for Congressman Cole at the end of that session because I'm sure many of you that know Congressman Cole will know that he's a historian. So we tried to kind of pique his interest and we're going to ask him, you know, if if there's any previous kind of historic events that have shaped national policy that is now being influenced again by COVID. So I'm really looking forward to that conversation, Scott. I know you're a bit of a historian as well, so I know that you will enjoy that question. But I think most every public library in Oklahoma is, is really involved in workforce development. And in, in some ways, that's just being the connectivity. So, you know, you can't even apply for a job at Walmart or the dollar store without going online. And so many of the things that we're doing is helping customers get an email address. I mean, things that we take really for granted that if you're out there and you are a job seeker and, and you don't have those tools, that it's very difficult to really get a job and, and to break back into um, the workforce. And, and that's not even accounting for if you have another roadblock, which is you have been incarcerated. So the work that public libraries are doing to really get people back to work is um, at the forefront of what we're about, especially now with so many people being furloughed and laid off. And Caroline, I want you to just talk a little bit about our partnership with the business community, not only in Norman, but across the system. 
Well, you touched on many of the things that we do that brings the business community in. And then what we do is we try to do it on a, a more personal basis. Um, we show up at the things that we know are happening in our community so that we're always aware of what community resources are there that we can then share with our customers. And a lot of what we do is on a one by one basis. A lot of people come in and need that individual help. They need to get on the computer to figure out how to apply for a job. Um, sometimes when we, when we can, we have um, job fairs and we do resume trainings and we do um, things in conjunction with the city of Norman or um, with the community to have job opportunity fairs. And we're looking at trying to do that somehow virtually, Scott. So, because one of the things that we're always aware of is that people need jobs. What we don't know is what jobs are out there sometimes to connect them to. So that's the part where you guys can be a partner. And my staff are all coming in to see what's going on. I told them we were hosting business before hours this morning. And I think they thought you guys were gonna actually be here, but crowd behind me, at least so you can, you can all. They thought there was gonna be coffee and donuts. They, they probably thought there was gonna be coffee and donuts. So now I will probably have to go get coffee and donuts. You can come like right in there so I can see you. What? Just say hello. Um, you'll notice they're all wearing our brand new Pioneer masks so that they can be easily identified as Pioneer staff members and so, Scott, we'll, we'll be sure and highlight that we bought them locally uh af after um dan shim told us where to get them very good yeah i'll put a plug in for that uh if anybody needs masks you can go to our website normanchamber.com and we have a covid resource page there of uh, local businesses who are selling masks and i it's hard for me to see, but I'm sure those are probably have a wonderful logo or something on them. And a lot of the companies, local companies can personalize them uh, to your liking. So, uh, oh yeah, that looked perfect. Looks great. That's wonderful. Uh, and let me put in a plug uh, for the, the system and how we uh, partner uh, with Pioneer. And this is just one very small aspect, but uh, each year for, for a handful of years, uh, the city, the library system, and we've just been a partner in this opportunity uh, during Small Business Week every year, which is in May, uh, to uh, the, the library has spearheaded the effort to help uh, provide opportunities for startups and uh, entrepreneurs who are in their infancy uh, to provide resources to them. And uh, sadly, we weren't able to do that this spring. Uh, best of intentions just wasn't able to happen. And, and again, we were all really looking forward to coming to New Central Library for that, uh, for that event, but we'll, we'll redo that again this coming year. But it's just another way that we can partner together. And I think I'll probably end it there since we're getting close to the nine o'clock hour and really uh, hit home and emphasize that term partnership. Uh, I think uh, whether it's the chamber, the library system, or, or other entities out there, often we get a little too much in our own, own silos, and we don't fully appreciate the strength and the resources that we can all bring to the table to do pretty big things for our community. And what I've uh, really appreciated about Pioneer Library System and their other local partners is, is when we work together, we can do amazing things. And, and that's evidence clearly uh, through Norman Ford. And I, I wanna close with that is that I remind everybody that's on the call that, that if, uh, if you're as pleased as I am with the outcome of what we've seen already with Norman Ford, I would hope uh, that you would get energized in these coming weeks and help spread the word about the election on August the 25th uh, there are still great things to come in regards to Norman Ford and how we can uh, best improve the overall quality of life for our community. So with that, uh, Melody, Lisa, thank you so much for spending uh, your first hour of the day with us today. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, we thank you for your passion, your commitment to libraries all across our state, whether it's statewide or, or here locally. 
And uh, I want to say thank you again to our guests uh, that, that are joined us from different uh, parts of the state this morning. Thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody very, very soon. Until then, uh, take care, be healthy, and stay well. Bye-bye.